to start off my talk, while I was um, traveling, coming uh, uh, yesterday in a train, I had a lot of time in my hand, and I didn't have my speech ready. Uh, so I was thinking, what should I talk about? Should it be something meaningful, something impactful, something educational, or it might be even my journey? And I realized there was something that is common amongst all of us sitting here today. That one fabric that literally binds us together, our Indianness, our Indian fabric. And our Indian culture is so diverse, so rich. Uh, and yet, we stand here at the cusp of history, talking about climate change, this catastrophic uh, event that might happen is already unraveling. And what can we do about it? So I thought, maybe what I'll touch upon, because it talks about championing uh, and showcasing solutions to fight climate change. Maybe what I'll talk about is the ancient Indian civilization, that l the lessons that can, we can learn from it, the modern India, the basic ethos that can actually help world fight climate change. And what might those, would be, might those be? So I said, let's start with real worthy sustainability hacks. I mean, that's, that's in trend, right? Reels are in trend. So, beauty and hygiene. Our ancestors used neem combs, bamboo combs, because it doesn't generate uh, static and prevents breakage and, and prevents breakage and hair fall. Uh, you, have, you had neem twigs for toothbrushes. You had uh, sugar and lime uh, for skin care, milk and turmeric for skin care, Rita, Amla, Shikakai for hair care. And I mean, if I have to say, and let's see how many of you agree, that in this world today, where early graying, hair fall, blemish skin is such a com commonality today, uh, the long locks of our grandmother hold testimony to this age-old wisdom of uh, zero waste beauty. Doesn't it? It does, right? Let's talk about food uh, from an Indian culture perspective. We were probably the most diverse uh, cuisine in the world. Uh, and, and it's mostly plant-based. And when we look at food, we don't talk about the calories of the food. We talk about the prana, the life of the food. And we also know that one of the biggest polluters and contributors to climate change is the meat industry. So plant-based diet could actually be a game changer in this fight for climate change. Utensils, copper, aluminum, iron. I mean, our ancestors knew that these added minerals and have medicinal properties and are great conductors of heat. So you need lesser heat and lesser fuel. Let's talk about clothes. I have a couple of really interesting anecdotes around clothes and probably some of you will remember as well. Uh, firstly, everything was 100% biodegradable uh, organic fabrics, but let's think about an old sari that our mothers, our grandmothers would have. They would wear it for ages, pass it on to generations, and when it was completely used and torn, worn and torn, it would be converted into a beautiful blanket, if you remember. Then it would be again used for ages, and then when it was completely torn, that blanket, it would be converted into a mop for our kitchen platform and ultimately the house floor. And when that cloth was completely out of life, torn into pieces, and we thought that's the end of it, it would then be weaved into a fine doormat. That is what the Indian culture teaches us. Then there was Khadi. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the nation, so, so much put focus on Khadi. And what is Khadi? Khadi is slow fashion, the epitome of slow fashion. Everything was built of organic materials, but built with hand, made with hand, made with love. And that's what the world needs today. I think most importantly, what I uh, in this real worthy sustainability hacks that I want to talk about is respect. We, as a culture, as people, respected everything. We prayed to trees and plants. We even prayed to the food that we are about to consume. We prayed to animals, to mountains, to rivers. Basically, our ancestors knew that the universe is existing in a fine, fine balance. And the moment even a sing slightest change happens, or any single entity is damaged, it will lead to the destruction of the entire planet, and ultimately mankind. Apart from that, 
let's talk about our Vedas. Now, our Vedas taught that the human mind, body, and surroundings need to be in constant harmony, that there needs to be an equilibrium maintained, and the body is one with its environment, with each given equal respect. So this body and my environment needs to be one and needs to be given equal respect, how we respect ourselves, our body, we want to eat well, we want to work out, we want to be in the fittest shape, our environment needs to be that as well. I mean, in Guru Granth Sahib, it says, Pavan Guru Pani Pita Mata Tarat Mahat. Air is the guru, the teacher. Water is the father. And, mud and earth is the great mother that provides. Now let's talk about Indus Valley Civilization, probably the oldest civilization in the world, Mohenjo-daro, Harappa, two of the oldest cities, well-planned cities in the world, more than 5,000 years ago, when the rest of the world was still living, living a nomadic life, living in forests, we gave the world its first planned cities, built in grid-like structures, well-maintained neighborhood, drainage systems, so on and so forth. So the question might arise, what happened to this great civilization? How did we end up in this mess that we see us? Uh, I mean, I, I came from the railway station to the hotel, and it's a mess that we've created for ourselves. I mean, there wasn't a single tree with leaf where, where it was green. The leaves were all brown because of the dust, because of the pollution. How did we get into this mess? Well, we could talk about the rulers, the invaders, the colonizers, the plundering that happened. I think that's not relevant. Not relevant today. We've been independent for 75 years. The truth is that we are in this mess today and that we've forgotten the ancient Indian traditions of slow living. So much so that a century ago, we had a man walk amongst us. We call him the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi. He had two primary struggles during his Satyagraha movement. One was against the British for our own freedom. And the second was against our own peoples, you and I, our fathers, our forefathers, our ancestors, our own peoples littering unclean, unhygienic habits. We won the first fight. We got freedom from the British in 1947. A century later, we're still in the shackles of our own peoples, our unclean, unhygienic littering habits. It's that huge a problem. Littering has become ingrained in our culture. Now, a culture, a civilization which gave the world lessons into slow living, meaningful living, respectful living, but it's become so ingrained in our culture where we respected everything and each entity equally. A civilization which built these great planned cities 5,000 years ago. However, there's a lesson that to be learned even with the Hindus Valley civilization, which is very, very critical and relevant to what we talk about here. Those cities flourished for 1,500 years, almost 1,500 years, and were abandoned. Now, historians believe two primary reasons. One, climate change. Weakening of monsoons. Changing of the course of river Ghagar, Hakra, and Indus rivers. Aridification of land. Uh, reduced water uh, supply. Reduced food security. Floods. All of these led to the climate change that they experienced and had to move away. And second was reduction in trade. Now, that also could be contributed or attributed to climate change because climate change led to reduction of agricultural produce, led to reduction of trade, and ultimately people moved to greener pastures to try to sustain. Now, in this valley civilization, the population of it, comprising of thousand odd cities, expanding over four countries, pales in front of the population of Delhi, two crore people, 20 million people, and yet, the lessons of climate change that happened at that time, the climate change which occurred at that time, some of the some of those things that I mentioned, is happening at an unprecedented rate ever right now. It's unraveling in front of us. And it, these are shifts which are literally irreversible, and we are not really doing 
anything meaningful about it. But I also, in terms of climate refugees, we hear climate refugees as a, as a, as a term. It's an unprecedented increase in terms of climate refugees. And whatever climate change does not do, the wars and conflicts that we create, we humankind create, we create uh, climate refugees as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the present is bleak. The future is bleaker, riddled with unpredictability, riddled with real survivability challenges. But I do believe there's hope. And that hope will come from this ancient wisdom combined with certain technological innovations, some common sense, and a lot of political will. Some of us might be sitting here by it also what to look at, how we can contribute politically, because that's an extremely critical cog into the climate action and climate change, uh, unraveling and, and fighting climate change if we really want to. But I do believe that's possible. And to unravel some of it, I'll talk about the modern Indian middle-class man, or, or woman, of course. We talked about the plant-based diet. We talked about uh, how a middle-class Indian has always been a hoarder. Everything that came into the house was reused, uh, repurposed and used as much as possible. I gave you the example, the beautiful example of a sari to a doormat, that journey. It, it was beautiful and something that we've all seen. I mean, my grandmother, even my mother and aunties, I remember, uh, every month or every two months, they would gather together, get all of their clothes together, and some Bartanwali would come from, let's say, Kolkata, if I remember correctly. And a day-long negotiation would happen, and in, in return of those clothes that they probably did not need, they would get really shiny new utensils. I don't know if some of you remember, but that's something that's, that's a beautiful memory that I have. I mean, my grandmother, again, it would be a community activity to get uh, the community along and make masalas, uh, do this every week. And again, it, these are like small examples of slow living. I personally, uh, got into sustainable travel because of my mother. My mother worked in the Archaeological Survey of India. She made us travel all over the country. And the lesson that I remembered was, whatever that you consume, throw it in a trash bin, and mostly we didn't find trash bins, so what we used to do, put it in our pockets or in our bags and take it back home. That remained with me. Mahatma Gandhi's words, everyone needs to be their own scavengers, scavenger, remained with me. I combined these two teachings of my mother and Mahatma Gandhi to start this movement called the Litter Free India Movement six years ago. I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to contribute to the country, contribute to the nation, contribute to the environment. And how could I do it? I started with my running group. I started cleaning up. I got my running friends involved, and we began running and cleaning up. Very organically, it became India's first eco-fitness movement. We took it to various cities. And then at some point, I realized I can't continue with my feet in two different boats. So I decided to make the dream. And you talked about Martin Luther King. It so resonated with me because I always say I have a dream, a dream to see a litter-free India. And I'm on that mission to make that dream a reality. So I, in 2019, I took this mission to 50 cities in 50 days, cleaned up 1,000 kilometers on the foot, and that's when the government of India adopted our mission, it becoming probably the first such a citizen-led movement that was adopted by the government of India. And since then, almost a crore people have participated. And a great example is right here in Kanpur. I've never been to Kanpur. This is my first, uh, first visit. And to see people, wonderful people, the blogging community here, driving change on the ground, that's, that's, that's what we need. And, and I might have been that catalyst, that spark who might have started the change, but you guys, are actually responsible for driving real change. You guys are real change makers and inspiring people, not only in the city, but across cities to follow in your footsteps. And that's, what, that's the lesson that I want to give you all, that if you want to make a change, don't think about how many people are standing behind you, how many people are going to support you. When you want to drive actual change, you probably will be one person going in that direction. And as you make that change possible, as you make that change happen, People follow your actions, not your words. That will be the long-driving uh, impacts that you create. Lastly, I want to really drive home a point, because we're talking about sustainability, is that we are all humans. And humans pollute just by our existence. 
We're not like trees which give out oxygen during the day. So we will pollute with every breath that we take. The only thing that we can do is that with every breath that we take, with every move that we make, with every action that we take, can we make that a more meaningful, a more positive impact? Whatever that you do, just think twice at, as to what that action means to your planet and try to make that a meaningful, positive impact. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to end out my talk.